Dr. Adrian Lombard, uh, who's been involved in falconry since the age of 13, when he was fascinated by the complexity of living and partnering, partnering with a hunting raptor. His specialty has been flying black sparrowhawks in the Western Cape. He has represented South Africa at the International Association for Falconry and the Conservation of Birds of Prey since 2004 and is now the president of that organization. And if you thought he had any spare time, he doesn't because he's also a doctor in private practice. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for coming to join us this evening. Um, it's nice to see quite a few familiar faces in the audience. And those of you who know me from medical practice are possibly going to see a different aspect of me tonight. <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, I'm hoping this isn't going to be a sort of didactic lecture, but I'm going to try, try and tell you a story, a story about the development of falconry in a modern world. Um, there'll be, I'm sure, plenty of time for discussion at the end. So we'll save questions for then, but if you feel I'm making no sense at all, please do stop and tell me. Um, if I'm getting boring, shuffle and yawn and I'll move on. Um, yeah, um, I'm not sure if anybody has had a chance to read the couple of books that I suggested. Uh, H is for Hawk by Helen MacDonald, and then No, <coughs> no Way But Gentleness. Um, Helen also wrote a book which is simply known as Falcon, and it's not similar in any way to her book H is for Hawk. It's, it's a far more sort of factual anthropology, as it were, of the relationship between humans and raptors, falcons in particular, and it's available in Kindle on Am Amazon if anyone's interested in that. Um, I haven't prepared any lecture notes. Um, I'm going to give you a few websites during the course of the talk, so you can look those up if you want to get more information about specific things. Firstly, can, can you all hear me, by the way? Okay. Um, hmm. Glitch number one. It must be an on-off switch or something. Sorry. It's uh, not working. Okay, let's... Um, uh, uh, maybe it's... Get your pointer out, but otherwise it's just there. Okay, Do you mind? I can... Sure. So is the... I'll try, yeah. I'll try and change the battery. That's okay, I've got it. Okay, well, you've heard who I am, and I think a good many of you know already who I am. Perhaps I just uh, a brief mention. We've mentioned the International Association for Falconry and the Conservation of Birds of Prey. Um, I've been part of this organization since 2004 when I first represented South Africa there. I've served it as executive secretary, and now I'm the, the president in my final sixth year of office. Um, and I think it's a nice credit for South African falconry that we are well enough thought about internationally that I've been able to occupy this position. The IAF is a, it's an international NGO. It represents falconry. It's its um, promotional and advocacy organization. Um, we represent something just over 120 falconry and falconry-related organizations from all over the world and from 90 different countries. Um, we're a full NGO, international NGO member of the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, and we represent falconers at all of the international, major international conventions and conferences which deal with conservation. We're also an advisory NGO to the convention Intangible Cultural Heritage of UNESCO. Um, so if we're going to start off with the question of what is falconry, perhaps we should take the definition provided by the IAF. 
which in its constitution says that falconry is a traditional sport of taking quarry in its natural state and habitat by means of trained birds of prey, and it's a hunting art. I have a little bit of discomfort with this definition because most falconers don't really like falconry being considered a sport. We consider it's an art. Uh, we think calling it a sport or a hobby somewhat trivializes it. Um, it's something that people spend their whole lives trying to perfect. Um, the natural state and habitat, this is not shooting canned lions. We, we are wanting our birds to hunt properly in the wild. Um, and the other thing is by means of trained birds of prey. This tends to suggest that one hunts with a hawk as you would hunt with a rifle. It isn't, there's a subtle difference. It, this is hunting with a hawk as you would go hunting with your brother. Okay, your, your hawk is not your tool nor your servant. So, Another description of falconry, and this comes from Sheikh Zayed bin Sultan al Nayan, who was the founding father of the Ar United Arab Emirates. He was the man who saw the transition of the Bedouin in, in that small country from people who lived as nomads in the desert to now one of the wealthiest nations on earth, one of the leading conservation contributors on earth. And he said that falconry is a constant reminder to us of the forces of nature, of the interrelationship between living things and the land they share, and of our own dependence in nature. And that's quite a profound statement. It's quite a th big thing for falconry to live up to. And I hope that perhaps some of these points will come out as we discuss it. And then this is another guy, 1946. Aldo Leopold, who is one of the early leaders of, of modern conservation, environmental conservation in, in the United States, had this to say about falconry. He says, the most glamorous hobby I know today is the revival of falconry. So we take issue over hobby, but he noted in 1946 that there was a revival in falconry. And then he goes on to say, moreover, the hawk, at slightest error of techniques, may either go tame or fly away into the blue. Here, he's actually very insightful of what we do. If you go to a falconry display, for example, you can go to, to um, Eagle Encounters at Spear, which is a it's a very good organization. It's well worth a visit. But the birds that you will see flying there are absolutely tame. They're there to do displays. They rely on their trainer for food. <coughs> or fly away into the blue. This is the wild hawk, which doesn't need you. It can live fine without people. And somewhere, falconry occupies the middle ground, where you have to persuade the bird that you are some benefit to it, that it wants to remain with you. And this is, the, this is where the art comes in. And then he went on to say, all in all, falconry is the perfect hobby, which is a nice accolade from a, a very renowned conservationist. So another thing that Aldo Leopold said in 1946 was that falconry has a few addicts in America and perhaps a dozen in England. Well, something has changed since then. Firstly, we've discovered that there are falconers in countries we'd never heard of, flying hawks we'd never heard of, in ways that we'd never heard of, and we've managed over the intervening years to meet these people. And then, for various reasons which we'll discuss, falconry has grown and expanded and is enjoying a sort of golden age, a real revival that he foresaw in 1946. And we'll look at the reasons for that. But we estimate that there are possibly something around 100,000 falconers in the world today. We've just unlocked the door to the falconers in China, a country where we all presumed falconry had been banned because hunting is banned there, so no one would do it. We found that there are at least 10,000, possibly as many as 20,000, and we're now welcoming, welcoming them into our organization, and it's a real eye-opener. It's incredible. 
Um, so why, why is there this revival of falconry? And I like to see this as a phenomenon that inextricably linked with the fortunes of the peregrine falcon. If you think about falconry, you will probably think about people and peregrine falcons, and certainly it's the iconic bird of falconry. And what happened to this bird is part of the reason why there are so many falconers today. So in the end of the 50s and beginning of the 60s, there was a collapse of many raptor populations around the world, particularly in the Western industrialized countries. And the peregrine, being the top of the food chain, was particularly affected. At the start of this collapse, no one understood why. And indeed, I've got documents which show that the falconers were among the first to recognize that something bad was going on in the world. I have a letter from the British Falconry Club to their Department of Environment saying, we have noticed that the peregrine falcons are failing to breed this year. Therefore, we are going to decline the permits that you have given us to take wild falcons from the nests because we don't think it would be right in the present circumstances. Because in those days, all the falconry raptors came from the wild. This is a situation that had been going on, and we'll discuss it, something like four or five thousand years at least, that falconry raptors have been used sustainably, taken from the wild, very often flown for a while and released back to the wild. And that was still the case in the late 1950s and early 60s. Well, the peregrine falcon populations collapsed. They disappeared completely in quite a lot of parts of the world. The eastern seaboard of the United States, the center of Europe, falc peregrine falcons were gone. Along with peregrine falcons went the northern goshawk. Certainly it was exterminated in Britain. The red kite was also exterminated in Britain. So all sorts of other things disappeared. And the songbirds then started disappearing as well. Rachel Carson wrote her famous book, Silent Spring. And we all knew then what the cause was. But before the cause was recognized, people were quite quick to cast the blame. They said, you know, it's those falconers. <laughs> They've been taking birds out of the wild, and they're selling them to the Arabs. It's them. And so there was a call by BirdLife to ban falconry worldwide. Let's do away with it, because it's bad news. Fortunately for us, somebody did the science, and they found it was the organochlorine pesticides, the classic is DDT, and these were what were leading to all the extermination of birds. What it does is, it's a, DDT is a wonderful poison, you can eat it. <coughs> it kills insects, but it doesn't break down, it accumulates in fat, and in birds, it causes thinning of the eggshell, so when it accumulates enough, the eggs eggs can't hatch because the shells break and the birds die, well, the chicks die. So this was the cause, and the first and most obvious thing to do is to ban DDT, so that was done. But there were parts of the world where there were no falcons left. In 1968, I think it was, there was a conference, there was the Madison Conference, to decide what to do about the peregrine falcon and how to restore it. At that conference, there was a decision made that they would breed falcons for release. They had to breed a lot of falcons. The problem was, at that stage, nobody really knew how to do it. So that was the, the start of the effort breeding raptors. There had been one record of somebody in Japan in the 16th 17th century who had bred a goshawk. Rather uh, something we don't claim with any great pride is that uh, Himmler's personal falconer managed to breed a peregrine falcon in 1942. And so there was some idea in Germany that it was possible. But from the Madison Conference, Professor Tom Cade at Cornell University 
started his breeding project. And at the same time, across in Europe and Germany, Christian Saar and the Faulkners and conservationists there started breeding, and they learned the recipe. How do you breed falcons and other raptors in, in captivity? Of course, once you learn the recipe to something, it becomes easy, but it hadn't been done before. They learned how to breed peregrine falcons literally on an industrial scale. They released thousands of them, both in North America, in across Europe. We even bred a few in Southern Africa, which we released. It wasn't really necessary here, but it was the technology and we tried it. Other birds were also had also been lost in this extermination. So birds like goshawks and the red kite could be bred again and released, and they were. Um, just trying to get the name right, Brian Jones won the Cincinnati Award, I think it is, in 2016 for his restoration work. He'd been working on Mauritius using the same technology. We restored the Mauritius kestrel and the um, Mauritian crested pigeon and at least one other species. Um, there are all sorts of birds now all over the world which could be bred because this technology had been developed. The last population of birds to be restored, the last population of peregrines, were the tree nesting peregrines in Central Europe. So you have a huge area of Europe extending from Germany right across Belarus into, into Russia, which is forest, and there aren't mountains and cliffs for peregrines to nest in. But some time in the past, peregrines had learnt to nest in raven nests and buzzard nests. Now what we've learnt about peregrines and many other birds is that during the, their period in the nest as chicks, they imprint on various things. They will imprint on sexual partner, they'll imprint on food source, and they learn to imprint on nest substrate. So peregrines which have been raised on cliff faces won't go and nest in trees. And to try and restore a population of peregrines nesting in trees took special techniques. And we used something which is called hacking, which is an old tried and tested falconry technique where you create an artificial nest box, and this was put up in a tree, and the birds are then do their final rearing in the box and are released from the box where they're fed for a while until they go free. And so these, this last population is now being restored. In Germany, it's now secure. There are about 30 plus wild peregrine nests nesting in the tree, trees in the forest there. And this particular picture, this is the first peregrine which hatched in a Polish tree nest in the wild in 50 years. This is a little group of falcons and conservationists who'd been responsible for the project. And they'd come to ring this chick and celebrate. So what is the status of the peregrine in the world today? And we can fairly confidently say that there are probably more peregrines in the world today than there ever were before. Peregrines are doing extraordinarily well. They've learned to nest in artificial structures, so they're nesting in church spires and high-rise buildings, and TV moss. Just about every cathedral in Europe has got a pair of peregrines nesting in it. They're living on pigeons. And I heard recently that there are nine pairs of peregrines in the greater London area. Now, if you think about it, there's nowhere for peregrines to nest naturally in the greater London area. So, and what are they living on? Well, they're living on pigeons. They're also living on ringneck parakeets, which are an incredibly invasive species that spread all the way from Asia to London. And there, in the photograph of these birds in a nest, a little pile of red beaks. Okay. Has this changed the attitudes of conservationists towards falconry? Remember, they were calling for our banning in the beginning of the 70s. It has with some conservationists, but we still confront antipathy and suspicion for whatever reason. So I'm going to stay with conservation, the falconer's role in conservation, for a bit before we move back to, to pure falconry. 
uh, because there are other challenges, and there are current challenges, which are important to all of us. Ladies and gentlemen, that's what 300 Seiko Falcons in a room looks like. I hope I never see anything like this again, that we could maybe reach a time when this cannot happen. The Seiko Falcon is one of the most important falconry birds. It's a large falcon. It occupies a huge range extending from Hungary in the west as far as China in the east, Siberia in the north, and it migrates south in the winter into Arabia and northern, northern Africa. And it had been noticed that some populations of this species were declining, and declining badly. And so there was a call by BirdLife Hungary to, and I note them because we're actually working very well with them at present, but they called in 2011 for an uplisting of the Seiko falcon at the Convention for Migratory Species from Appendix 2 to Appendix 1, and it certainly deserved uplifting, uplisting, but they blamed excessive harvesting for falconry. Once again, this sounds awfully familiar, and once again, thank goodness, we did the science. And we'd already noticed this, and falconry-driven projects were on the go in Central Asia. And what we had found was that there is an enormous attrition of birds of prey across... In fact, it's a global issue, but it's dramatic in Central Asia. We have a growing economy, we have the spread of medium voltage distribution lines which are absolutely perfect raptor killers. <laughs> You've got to imagine the steps of Central Asia are flat as a table, there are no trees. <laughs> there are no poles for power lines, so they use reinforced concrete poles which are earthed. And the falcon lands on this because there is nowhere else to land and it's toasted. We estimate that at least 5,000 Seiko falcons a year are killed in Mongolia alone. This is actually shocking. That number, 5,000, would satisfy the Arab market. So the causes for the decline were revised, and they were revised to say that electrocution is the main cause. Electrocution is a problem. It's a problem in South America. It's a problem here in Africa. And as we are going to see greater electrification in Africa, so things like our vultures and our raptors are going to get wiped out. And we've got to be very aware that this is happening. <coughs> Land change usage. Those flat steps were used as the grain basket by the USSR. They had massive collective farms trying to grow wheat there. I don't know how well it worked. But when the USSR collapsed, so land use went back to running goats and sheep and small peasant farms. Um, and what happened was that the rodents, which were living in the wheatlands, declined. And that's the food of the sakers during their breeding time. So land use change was also part of this picture. And then there's absolutely no point in denying that illegal trade is an issue, and we would very much like to see this regulated and corrected. So what have we done about it? We participated in developing the Global Action Plan for the CMS UNEP-led plan to, re to deal with the conservation of the Seiko Falcon. And we as an organization have led the implementation of this plan. We also propose, we're the proponent for a motion for a recommendation, the IUCN World Congress in 2016. And this is preventing electrocution and collision impacts of power infrastructure on birds. We were the proponent and we had co-sponsors which included BirdLife International, BirdLife South Africa, BirdLife Zimbabwe. We got Cape Nature on board. And Endangered Wildlife Trust. You see, I had something to do with it because I was calling on all my friends that I could contact locally here. Isenvillo, KZN Isenvillo Wildlife. And we got our motion through. And the motion calls on funders of electri on electrification projects to ensure that the, project, that the infrastructure is built correctly not to kill birds. And if you'd like to take that little website down, it's still in construction, but you can see what we're doing to try and promote this. And we've got it out there. I think it's in 15 different languages now. Um, 
advice on to how to deal with this problem. But there are still an estimated 100,000 migratory birds killed across the world, and it's going to get worse. It's the medium volt voltage distribution lines that electrocute birds, and it's the wind turbines and the heavy voltage transmission lines which cause collisions and are taking up things like our secretary birds and the bigger bustards and so on. So, just a little question. What is the tragedy of this particular species? Anyone want to take a guess at what this species is? It's a brown eagle, medium-sized, and it's got quite a distinctive characteristic. Ah, uh, no. It's a, it's a step eagle. Okay, Colonepolensis. It's got a very wide gape, because if you live on the steps, everything wants to rob you. You've got to swallow quickly, so you need a big mouth. That's this guy. What's his tragedy? Okay, his tragedy, he stepped from near threat, no, from least concern. So the IUCN has the red list. You may well have heard of this, where they, they monitor the conservation species. They're trying to do it for every species in the world and set a level of conservation concern. So this species stepped from least concern, which is the bottom, to endangered, which is one step before sort of near extinct one step. And why did this happen? Well, it was getting killed for exactly the same reason that Saker falcons were getting killed, but nobody cares. This bird, Big Eagle, was full up in the steppes. In summer, it migrates down, comes down to southern Africa. If you go to Zambia, Zimbabwe, you see flocks of these eagles flying around eating the termites, and they're gone. They're gone because nobody cares. So. If somebody says to you, oopsie, sorry, we're going to go back one. If somebody says to you that it's bad to, to commodify animals, we need to think about this. If you make an animal a commodity, is it bad for the animal? It wasn't bad for this guy. Nobody was making him a commodity, and he went, and no one noticed. Okay. Just staying with conservation and conservation concerns, and that is the loss of biodiversity all over the world. And there are a lot of causes for it, and I'm sure you're all familiar with a lot of these causes. Things like global warming, unsustainable land use, land use change, agricultural intensifications, all changing the way we, we work in the world. But what falconers have recognized is that there are declines in small game species, the things that we hunt, because Everything else was going. The insects, the hedgerows, the, the little things that needed to keep a, an, a, an ecosystem alive. He said the partridge is the bird which falconers across Europe, it's their favorite quarry species, and it was common in Europe. And suddenly falcons are saying there are no partridge left. So, well, this is a really good indicator species. It needs little patches of natural environment so that it can breed. It needs insects to raise its chicks on. And if that goes, they go. And it's, the cause for this is intensive agriculture, these monoculture deserts, biofuels. So you can plant thousands of acres of maize, and nothing else grows in those fields. The hedgerows go, the edges go. You spray the edges with ritter to make sure that there's no plants. You spray the, the crop with neonicotinicide poisons and all the insects go, including our pollinators, so bee populations and other more humble pollinators are disappearing. And it's, this is something of real concern. What we're trying to say here is that falconers are good sentinels within the environment because we're out there often. We take our hawks out. If we can, we'd go out every day. We see what happens in the environment. And then we are trying to make a difference. We're trying to teach people how to try and restore biodiversity within these agricultural environments. So if you'd like to visit this website, it's also in multiple languages. Um, and it's giving advice to ordinary people in the country how to try and restore their biodiversity.
So, to get back to the main story of the evening, why, what are the factors that have contributed to the revival of falconry? And I think that the principal one here is that captive breeding of falcons and other raptors has put, has given access to falconry to many, many more people than were ever able to do it before. We can discuss this, it's a good and a bad thing, but all of a sudden you don't have to take birds from the wild, you can get them from a breeder. Um, you can breed your own. And so many, many more people are doing this all over the world. There's an increased access to an increased range of raptors. You don't have to take the raptor which is down the road, you can get ones that maybe don't occur in the same country. Pluses and minuses on that. But the Harris hawk, as Bird will discuss briefly tomorrow, is quite an interesting raptor. And it has put falconry into the hands of people who otherwise would not have time, would not have access to hunting because they can't go out every day with their birds. And a Harris hawk quite cheerfully goes out with you at the weekends. Um, we'll talk more about him tomorrow. There's modern veterinary medicine. We know how to keep our birds healthy and better husbandry skills, so we know more about how to feed them, how to look after them better, so birds are surviving better. And then there's all sorts of synthetic materials which can be useful to falconry. So falconry may be a traditional practice, but it's not one that doesn't grow and benefit from modern advances. If you look at this bird here in the picture, this is a jur falcon, a white jur falcon. This would have been the prized possession of a king or an emperor. It's now accessible to any falcon who is reasonably wealthy. <laughs> a really beautiful bird. It's sitting on a rubberized perch on an astroturf surface, which is better for the feet. It keeps the feet in better condition. It's got nylon jesses and a steel swivel. What you can't see is that it's wearing a little Teflon strap waistcoat with a transmitter on its back. So that's the next thing, the modern electronics, the use of, of directional telemetry and now satellite tracking. So this is another thing which has brought or made falconry develop. It's changed the practice of falconry. There was a book written in the late 1960s by Michael Woodford called A Manual of Falconry. In that book he gives one paragraph to radio telemetry and he says there's a modern newfangled uh, technique called directional telemetry. He didn't think that this was a particularly good development because all it would do would be to encourage falconers to fly their birds in unsuitable country. End of sentence. Boy. With the high of hindsight, how can you get it wrong? Because this has given us the ability to fly birds much looser and freer and higher than we've ever done before. And I'll give you an example of this later. So the style and quality of falconry that's being practiced in the world today is unlike it ever has been before. And then changing and training methods, understanding animal behavior better and psychology. There are methods like operant conditioning and imprinting and so on. That all can be brought into your training to try and get better reactions and responses from your bird. But there are underlying principles in the practice of falconry. How do we do it? And I think the first one and the most important factor to understand is that a falcon is never a servant. A falcon is never like your dog. It doesn't obey you. A falcon can be persuaded to be your partner. It can be persuaded to work with you because it depends on the bird recognizing that the fal falconer provides an advantage during the hunt. That the presence of the falconer means that he can present or provide quarry to the falcon that would be more difficult for the falconer to find without the falconer. And if that, that's the basic 
belief that you have to try and instill in your falcon to get it to work with you. If it stops believing that you help it to hunt, it goes and hunts by itself because it can. And these principles are as old as falconry and they aren't changed. So the skill of the falconer is to develop the hunting partnership and to try and maximize the fitness and the freedom of his hawk. Try and get, make the style of the hawk and the whole event as dramatic and as close to what happens in the wild as possible. So the reward of falconry, why do we do it? Well, it's this privilege of participating and sharing in this dramatic life of what really is an apex predator. This is just a picture of a November sparrowhawk chasing a masked weaver. It's something which one might get a glimpse of in the felt. Here's somebody very fortunately managed to snap a photograph of it. But it's something that all of us may glimpse once or twice in a lifetime in the wild, and even those who do bird watching. In Fishhook, where I live, there are a pair of peregrines. They've been there the whole time I've been there, and they hunt in Fishhook every day. They hunt and they catch probably at least two birds a day in Fishhook. I see them quite often, and if any of you are in Fishhook, if you early in the morning look up on the cross on top of the Catholic Church, and you may see one of the peregrines sitting there scoping the valley and looking for quarry. A little bit later, you'll see the peregrine sitting on the tower of the fire station, eating its quarry. <laughs> what happened in between? And if you go by in the evening, there's another one sitting on the tower, fire, fire, fire station tower, eating. So it's a place where they pluck and eat, but there's that drama that occurred in between. There are two basic types of birds that we use in falconry. I'm going to go tomorrow night into much more detail about the different birds that are used, but there are two broad categories of raptor. This is an example of what we call a long wing. These are the falcons. They have this long pointed wing. They fly very fast. They fly very high. They tend to hunt by stooping. That's, they, they dive through the sky um, and reach incredible speeds. Um, so this is, a, this is a peregrine falcon, an immature peregrine falcon. That's the transmitter hanging on its leg. It's quite an old photograph because we found better places to put the transmitters. This is another falcon. This is another falcon. This is a, an immature lana falcon, quite a popular bird in South Africa. Uh, this is the transmitter now positioned on the tail. And most of us are now moving to positioning it between the shoulders on a little Teflon tape which the bird preens in and forgets, so it's quite incredible. Um, the other type of raptor that is used is, are birds called short wings or broad wings. This is an example of the European or northern goshawk. But other examples would be birds like the black sparrowhawk that I've tended to fly, um, other kinds of sparrowhawk, and then things like the Harris hawk. Perhaps you could fit eagles into this category as well. Birds that fly off the glove, they have, they sprinters, they are remarkably fast accelera acceleration as they leave your glove, so they are very exciting birds for the falconer to fly, perhaps less, less of a spectacle for, for observers, for people coming out to watch, the falcons are, are nicer for that. But these are exciting birds to fly, and this, this goshawk is chasing a pheasant that's just disappeared off the picture then, and it's a split second thing. So let's talk a little bit about how we do the training. Firstly, the source of falconry raptors. We've talked about captive breeding, and this is, this is where most falconers nowadays over the world get their birds. But there's also the question of taking birds from the wild. This is how it was done or has been done for the last 5,000 years. And there's still a good case for it to be done today. 
because very small harvests are perfectly sustainable. A wild harvest involves the falconers in the conservation of those raptors and in the observation of them. It also means that one doesn't have to keep birds pinned up in cages for their entire lives as breeding populations. It also means that you can avoid a commercialization of, of the birds that are used in falconry. So in this country, because there are very few falconers and the birds which we are interested in are in small numbers, the conservation authorities here are persuaded that the way we should go is to take the bulk of the birds we use from the wild. It's a system that's worked very well. There's another source of birds, which is from rehabilitation. So there are numbers of young raptors, particularly young raptors, which get into trouble shortly after they leave the nest, either because they leave the nest too early or because their skills are not good enough. <coughs> and these birds pitch up at places like eagle encounters at Spear. And I believe that in this last breeding season, they had something like 14 peregrines were brought into Spear. All young birds that had left the nest too early or got into trouble shortly after leaving. Most of them they were able to put back on the nests. But there's about three, I think, which they weren't able to, and which are now going to be trained up by falconers to try and get them fit, get them hunting, because that's the only chance that these birds have to release back to the wild. So it's a service we do, but it's also, I suppose, a way that falcons come into falconers' hands. Um, so the process of training, this is a picture of a youngster with a bird called an African goshawk. Most young falconers in Southern Africa start off with an African goshawk. They are very common. Lots of young birds get into trouble, so there are quite a lot of them coming as rehabilitation birds. They're quite common in the suburbs. Um, and we like young falconers to start off with these birds. And the initial training involves a process of habituation or manning. The old term for it is manning birds. And this, if done properly, can be quite a rapid process where the bird, over a matter of days, learns to accept and trust the falconer and all the stuff that goes on with him. The house, the dogs, the car, <laughs> walking in the felt, all those things, children. The bird can learn very quickly if they're introduced well and rapidly in the early stages of training. And then one has to move from there to try and teach this hunting as association to teach the bird to pursue things from you. So everyone who starts falconry is desperate to get the bird to come back to them. Okay, but actually the problem is to teach the bird to go away from you. It's supposed to go away from you, go hunt stuff. Um, and that's what you help it do. So it's that association which we try and teach. We've also got to teach them fitness. We've got to get these birds fit and strong. Wild raptors are really fit and they only survive if they are at peak fitness. If you think about it, wild raptors and their quarry are pretty equally balanced. So a black sparrow hawk that hunts rock pigeons, those are, are quite finely balanced species. If that black sparrow hawk is not well, it can't catch a rock pigeon, it's not going to survive. If the rock pigeon is off color that day, it's going to get caught. So that's, and we have got to get birds fit enough so that they can. And then entering, how do you introduce the birds to a hunting situation. So we use all sorts of methods, and once again, this is where technology is, is our friend, and we are advancing on the old tried and tested methods. We've talked a little bit about hacking. This is where young birds are taken either out of a pen or out of a, a wild nest and are put into a hack box, which is a sort of a cage up on stilts where rap where Predators can't get at it, and the birds are kept there for a few days just to get them used to the area and fed there, and then the doors are opened and the birds are allowed to fly, but food is placed in the hack box every day and they come back and eat. 
But after a while, they start to get fit. They start hunting for themselves. They start returning not quite so often to the hack box. And that's the time you've got to try and catch them up if you want to use them for falconry or let them go if it's a restoration project. So hacking is an, is an old fashioned method which is still very much used for a variety of reasons. And then lure flying. Those of you who've seen falconry displays have probably seen somebody swinging a lure and the falcon stooping and diving at it. And it was one of the old fashioned ways of trying to get the bird fit. But there are problems with that. It focuses the falcon or the hawk on you. It keeps it looking inwards at you. You're providing the lure, you're providing food, but you want it to go away and fly and, free, uh, and hunt. It also teaches the bird that the lure is something which involves work, because you're training the bird and trying to fit in it, and you're pulling the lure away from it. And so it doesn't really like the lure. Okay. So the way I use a lure is that the bird doesn't see the lure unless it's going to be fed. And they'll throw the lure on the ground and it must come and land on it and it's going to be fed. And that's the only association I want with the bird and the lure. But that lure means that you get supper. So you get that lure, you get supper. So there are other ways we can use this lure. We can attach it to a kite. You can Put the kite up in the air, dangle the lure from it. The lure has a little quick release mechanism. It's got a parachute attached to it. The bird's got to fly up to the kite, catch the lure, and fly, the, fly it down. You can put the kite up higher and higher. So the bird's got to go up to 1,000 foot, 2,000 foot, and you get the bird really fit because it's working and climbing to go and fetch its supper. The problem with that, with a lure, is that, with a kite rather, is you've got to rely on the wind. Cape Town, you know, the wind's either 50 miles an hour or it's not there at all. So you can use a drone. So you can do exactly the same thing with a drone, modern technology. It's good. With the short wings, with the goshawks and sparrowhawks, we use a thing called a lure machine, which is a, a reel on a little motor that reels in a, a lure which you can design so the lure shoots away from you and the bird learns to go and chase that and gets developed fitness chasing that. And then we've developed techniques where we use an aeroplane. And this is a group of falconers just north of Cape Town with their, in the early morning. That's the aeroplane. Those are the falcons sitting in blocks there. And these are young birds getting trained up just before the start of the season. And the plane pulls the lure. And the lure also has a quick release mechanism, a little parachute. And you can fly these birds all over the sky chasing this aeroplane. And they get tremendously fit. And they love chasing this thing. So those are, are methods to try and get your bird really fit and get its fitness close to that the birds that live out in the wild. <coughs> and then entering. How do you enter the birds to hunt? So the next sort of truism is that the practice of falconry depends upon the innate propensity of a hawk to pursue quarry. We couldn't do falconry if hawks didn't chase, chase what they want to eat. And they will chase stuff if it's presented to them. The role of the falconer is to present the quarry in such a way that it builds up the hawk's skills and confidence. So there is your knowledge of the quarry, the way you work with the seasons, the way you find the quarry. Here are two pointers. There's a Franklin in the grass there. And you can get reasonably close and give the chance, a hawk a good chance to chase that. Another example is a falcon stooping in a two duck, which in a sort of marshy bit of ground, not a lot of dam to dive into. But one would build from this. And then the use of telemetry. Well, telemetry does a whole lot of things. It gives us confidence that we can fly the birds much freer and looser tells us what the birds are doing. So sometimes they rake away and they go and look for their own quarry. Sometimes they've got a plan up their sleeve. They know what they want to do. They're not flying away. They're trying to get higher. Or they're trying to get in a better position. And we don't understand what they're doing. So the use of telemetry has given us 
a much closer and better understanding of what is happening with our birds, particularly when we can't see them. And here's a falconer steering hopefully into the sunset as this falcon flies away. I don't know. <laughs> okay, I'm now going to give you a little example of what I've been talking about. Let's see if we can get this right. So this is an iPad screen. Um, and the falcon left the glove four seconds ago. The falcon is standing here, and the falcon has a satellite transmitter on its back. These are two little dams, and there's some duck on those dams. So the plan is, the falcon's going to try and hunt those duck. So that's time sped up ten times. Okay, so it's going a lot faster than in real life. This is altitude. So there are two altitude screens, and I think it's so the numbers can keep up with the rate of climb. And let's see what happens. Sorry. So the falcons left the glove, it flies over the dams, it's seen the duck, and now it's starting to climb. And it's climbing over the dams, so the ducks see it and stay on the water. It's going up reasonably fast, at two minutes at about 200 foot. It's working its way across towards that white field, because the white field has got lift on it. Yeah, it's going up, and the falcon knows that. So at four minutes, it's about 400 foot. Five and a half minutes at 600 foot. At this time, the falcon looks like a little cross in the sky. Now it's starting to get lift. Eight minutes, seven minutes, 800 foot. Eight minutes, nearly 1,000 foot. At this point, it's starting to get really difficult to see this bird. So 10 minutes, it's nearly 1,500 foot. And it's going up and it's thermal. It wants altitude so it can get speed. At 12 minutes, 1,800 foot. And now the falconer walks into the dam. And the fl duck flush off the dam and the bird stoops. And it strikes its duck there. Now, during this whole part of the flight, the falconer didn't know what his bird was doing. Couldn't see it. Technology tells us, and patience and experience tells us, that the bird is building up. And what it really wants to do is to get up to height so it can do a successful hunt. I'm going to now show you a little clip. It's not fantastic footage, but it's the end part of this hunt, so you can get an idea of what went on at the end there. Oopsie, sorry. Yeah. So these are the duck. They've just left the dam. The white-faced duck, this is in the tail. They're flying around the dam because they know that there's a falcon somewhere around, but they can't see it. I don't particularly want to hang around because there's a falcon who's walked up there. So they decide, about now, to go and find a different dam. And the bird is now stooping. comes up from underneath and it's coming down to ground with this duck. I'll give you an idea of the drama that's involved. Okay. Oopsie. I think one of the things that, that appeals to all of us who do falconry is that it's also just a wonderful excuse to get out into the felt in this natural environment and to become part of it. So thank you very much. Okay.
Okay, are there any, any questions? Or? Hi. Yes. Yes. Usually, in that setting, when you get up to him, the duck is dead. Um, then it depends what you want to do. You can easily trade off. Say you give him food that he likes in place of the duck, and you can eat the duck, <laughs> or you can save it, or you can feed him off the duck to really give him a, a reward and show the bird that that's that was really what he, he wanted to do. Does that happen on the spot where the killing, uh, where, where the? Uh, yeah. Yeah. You don't go take him home and do it. You would reward the bird at that point because that bird has actually just done exactly what you wanted it to do. And so you want to encourage that behavior. So then you've got to show him that was really successful. Now you can eat. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. That's, that's Helen telling it how it is, yeah. yeah. That's Helen being very honest about what sometimes has to happen, yeah. yeah. How many birds have you got in I very seldom have more than one. And where it? lives, okay, it lives in a muse, so we, we have a, a sort of pen which is constructed for it. During the hunting season, during the time I'm actively flying the bird regularly, Quite often it's in the house because you want it really tame and, and familiar with everything that's going on. Yeah. So Sorry? It's very dedicated, isn't it? It Yeah, yeah. If you your wife has got to be very tolerant. <laughs> um okay, I don't actually have a bird at present because unfortunately in my other involvement I I passed my bird on to a friend. The last bird I've flown is now three, and he's still flying it. And then before that, I flew a black sparrow hawk that's now eight. Yeah. So they, they do live quite a long time. But we had a, a hawk eagle which lived to 32 and died of natural causes. That's quite unusual, but eagles can live a long time. Most raptors live about 12 to 15 years, but they're high-risk lives as well. You know, accidents happen to them because of the way they live. Yeah. Where do you fly them or hunt in Cape Town? <laughs> Not in Cape Town. Well, you've got to go outside of Cape Town. So, Durbanville, um, I go out on the way to Stellenbosch, various farms. So, farmers we know give us permission. Uh, thing. Yeah. <coughs> You know, it's, it's, a, it's a very perceptive question. There's a whole lot of answers there. Firstly, they're very adaptable. The, the raptors which are suitable for falconry are often raptors which are very opportunist. And so they will look for opportunities. And you find in suburban areas around Cape Town, just outside this lecture room, there are a lot of raptors living here. Peregrines, black sparrowhawks, African goshawks, and they're all great opportunists. So they do live in in urban areas and adapt to, to change as well. That's behavioral adaption. There's a very interesting question <laughs> which was raised because the, the peregrine which was exterminated on the eastern seaboard of North America was, a, was a, it's a peregrinus, it's the anatum peregrine, peregrinus anatum, which was known as the duck hawk. And it was quite a, a large, aggressive peregrine which hunted duck and was popular with falconers because of that. The question now is whether the wild anatoms have changed because of urbanization, because of changing land use, and they're hunting far more pigeons and doves, and are they going to change in morphology and genetics? Yeah, we're not sure. 